Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is another week of Something's Happening Here, and if you're watching it live, this is the second week of 2023. So thank you for taking time out of your routine, your work routine, your school routine, to spend 15 minutes a day with us. With that in mind, we have a big topic this week. Uh, we are chasing some current events, and I, let's just get right to it so we don't waste any time. The message this week is called God's Rottweiler. And the reason we chose that title is because you may be aware that a pope of the Catholic Church just died a few days ago. Pope Benedict XVI um, was known as God's Rottweiler. So we're going to talk about this man, his life, his ministry, his death, and the theology and the prophecy that surrounds all of that. So God's Rottweiler. We're going to begin um, with this article from Slate, and uh, this is dated New Year's Eve of 2022, so just a couple weeks ago, and uh, and he and and it's gonna. I'm gonna read from this article a fair amount because there's a lot to say. Um, so let's just get right to it. Benedict the Sixteenth, born as Joseph Aloysius, I don't know how to say that. Aloysius Ratzinger was the head of the Catholic Church for just eight years, from 2005 to 2013, and will likely be remembered more for the ending of his papacy than any actions he took within it. Unlike, and pay attention to the wording of this sentence, okay? Unlike his predecessor, St. John Paul II, a diplomat and charismatic world leader, and his successor, Francis, a man of the people reformer, Benedict preferred a quieter and more scholarly role in the church. You, you like that? The other two are, are described with these glowing terms, but Benedict is quiet and scholarly. <laughs> you always got to pay attention to the editorial word choice of any given article. All right, it continues. A pontiff often described as a gifted theologian, more than a leader. Again, so that's an editorial choice there. More than a leader. Benedict favored traditionalism and strict doctrine, lashing out against what conservatives perceive as moral relativism as he sought to create a smaller but more theologically pure church. All right, and so as we go forward, we're just going to build off these core ideas that have just been expressed here. Slate takes the position not so much explicitly, but very, at least subtly, implicitly, that this dude was not a good dude, <laughs> that he brought controversy and, uh, and mess and somehow was an aberration in between these two wonderful popes or these two superior popes. So let's just read. There is some good details in this article, and, and I want to make sure to read those as well. But again, as we go forward, pay attention um, to the way that this slips into opinion without even acknowledging it most of the time. Okay, uh, Benedict's orthodoxy has led him, left him with a complicated legacy. Some of his most controversial work in the church came before his papacy when he was, under John Paul II, head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the powerful department within the Vatican that is tasked with spreading and defending Catholic doctrine. And we're going to talk more about that on Friday. <clears throat> In the 1980s, then Cardinal Ratzinger's CDF, that's the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, cracked down on theological debates that veered away from conservatism, investigating theologians, ousting seminary professors, and censoring articles and books. It came down hardest on the liberation theologists in Latin America who sought to empower the poor and oppressed. Once again, just noting the editorializing of this article, I'm reasonably certain that if you were to read uh, Pope Benedict's words that are being referenced here, right, uh, uh, the words against the liberation theology, uh, his, I, I'm willing to bet money that his rationale has nothing to do with um, opposing those who seek to empower the poor. That is a, that is a Slate.com editorial choice. All right, it continues. As Pope, Benedict also launched a deeply controversial multi-year investigation into women's religious orders in the U.S. because of the more radical views held by their members, as well as their more progressive ideas about homosexuality and gender roles in the church. As the, uh, as the Reverend Thomas Reese, 
formerly the editor-in-chief of the Jesuit magazine America, wrote in February, Ratzinger's problem was that he treated theologians like they were his graduate students who needed correction and guidance. And here's the uh, title of this week's episode, Many Dubbed Benedict God's Rottweiler. He, he's, he's rabid, man. He's going to rip you apart if you oppose him. And he's doing it all in the name of God. All right, so I, I should probably let you know from the beginning here, I am not a Catholic. I, I don't owe any loyalty to any pope, Benedict or otherwise. My loyalty is solely and squarely at the feet of Jesus Christ. That's it. And uh, I do belong to a church. It's not the Catholic Church. But really, my loyalty is not even fully with the church in which I hold membership because, again, I'm loyal to Jesus Christ and his holy written word, right? So any given church, mine or otherwise, that can find itself in harmony with the scriptures is going to have my support. And any church that finds itself opposed to the scriptures will also be opposed by me or at least exposed by me, right? I have one goal, and that is to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ in my own life and to each one of you or whoever will listen. So I just, I wanted to clear the air there because we're going to be talking about the Catholic Church historically, uh, prophetically, and probably otherwise. And I just wanted to, to let you know exactly where I stand on this. I am not really in favor of the Catholic Church. I'm not really opposed to the Catholic Church. Like, as an in institution, it is the largest Christian church on planet Earth. And therefore, in terms of the spreading of the gospel, um, is more effective than, than actually literally every other Christian organization on Earth put together. It's just in terms of numbers and efficiency. They have the largest education system on planet Earth. So, like, there's a lot commendable. Historically speaking, the Catholic Church invented hospitals. So anytime you need medical attention and find yourself at a hospital, you are living in the legacy of the work the church has done long ago, right? So I don't oppose it. I don't really support it. It just exists. And therefore, I am able to speak good and ill about it appropriately. And that's what we're going to do this week. We're going to look at some facts and we're going to compare them against the scripture and we will make some conclusions. Let's read again from the article here. There were other controversies surrounding Benedict's papacy as well. In a report published in January 2022, that's one year ago, Benedict was found at fault for in the handling of four sex abuse cases when he was the Archbishop of Munich and Friesing from 1977 to 1982. Next paragraph. On a diplomatic level, Benedict made several missteps. Most notably, at a 2006 lecture, he appeared to suggest that Islam was an inherently violent faith by quoting a 14th century emperor who described Islam as evil and inhuman. He has said he did not intend to say that he agreed with the comments. He later launched diplomatic efforts with Muslim leaders in an effort to make amends. He also lifted the church's excommunication on fringe right-wing bishops, including a Holocaust denier, and he rejected the promotion of condoms as a way of fighting AIDS. Um, on that last note there, he rejected the promotion of condoms. Um, that's not just him. I mean, the Catholic Church as a whole is opposed to birth control. Condoms, IUDs, uh, the pill, right, in every form because, and I'm not even saying I agree or disagree with it, that's just the case, right? It is Catholic doctrine that sex exists for the explicit purpose of creating children. So when you introduce a way to prevent the creation of children in the act of sex, the church comes down in opposition to that. That is not a universal Christian doctrine, but it is a Catholic doctrine. And so, again, I'm just pointing out this article is laying that at the feet of Pope Benedict um, in a negative way, and he rejected this, right? Everybody knows condoms are the way to fight AIDS, but he rejected it. Well, I'm just saying that it wasn't a personal choice of his. This is a church doctrine, <laughs> and he was just repeating the church's doctrine. More recently, continues the article, 
And this will be the last paragraph that we read today. Benedict had become an unwilling tool of those fighting culture wars within the church. And now we see Slate's true motivation on display here. When Benedict stepped down in 2013, he did so because he felt he no longer had the physical and mental strength to lead the institution. In doing so, he single-handedly established a new precedent for an ex-pope, a move reformers widely heralded as both selfless and wise. <laughs> but some of his choices unintentionally set up an awkward situation. By styling himself as a pope emeritus, declining to revert to his birth name, and continuing to wear white and live in the Vatican, Benedict did not create a clean break from the position. As a result, some of those who reject the teachings and reforms of Francis, which is a powerful and loud contingent, particularly in the United States, have come to see Benedict as the legitimate leader of the church. Many conspiracy theories within the church position Francis as an anti-pope. All right, dude, there is so much in this paragraph. <laughs> What's really happening here? I want to point out, Benedict did not create a clean break from the position. That's true. That's just a fact. And as a result of that, there has been kind of a slowly bubbling up theological civil war within the Catholic Church. And I'm not even going to put that at Benedict's feet here because that civil war has existed since the 1960s, since the Vatican II Council, which essentially changed <laughs> pretty much everything about the way that the church operates. But even though that, that kind of civil war has been happening for a generation, even still it kind of was brought to a new climax with this problem the, of Benedict stepping down without actually dying. And I appreciated what the article said here, that there are those who reject the teachings and reforms of Francis. Now, if you know anything about Pope Francis, his teachings and reforms tend toward the theologically liberal. You know, he is not willing to condemn homosexuality, for example. Now, I am, I'm not saying for or against. I'm just saying his position. The Catholic position traditionally has been against homosexuality and homosexual practice. Francis's position is, who am I to judge, right? And so, and so regardless of how you feel about any of that, we see that Francis's position um, is clearly more liberal than the church has traditionally taken and certainly more liberal than Benedict ever took. And because of that, there is now this powerful and loud contingent that rejects the more liberal Pope Francis, and until his death, instead believed that the former Pope Benedict was the true leader. If this sounds like a mess, friends, it's a mess. <laughs> and, um, and that's why we're starting off the week with this, because it's such a mess that we're going to spend the rest of the week unpacking it and trying to make sense out of it. But in summary, we are seeing that the largest church on planet Earth is in theological disarray. And just like with everything else in the world, it seems to boil down to the liberals versus the conservatives, right? The, the king of the south versus the king of the north, if you remember last week's episode. So we're going to leave it at that right now. And I'm going to ask you to come back again tomorrow so we can continue this discussion. And to make sure that you can continue or that you can come back tomorrow, let's make sure you are subscribed. So on Facebook, make sure you like this page and also change your notification settings to be alerted when we produce a new video. Uh, instructions for that are right under this video right now. If you're on YouTube, uh, hit your subscribe button and also your notification bell. And if you're watching on Talking Donkey International, navigate to the podcast page and bookmark it. And we'll let you know when we have a more direct subscription method there as well. So may God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow on Something's Happening Here. I'm Steve Hicks, and may God bless you.